Miami is back in the win column again, with the team delivering what may have been the best game of the season to date. Hello everybody, you are listening to Miami Total Football Radio, aka Miami Total Football Radio, the number one and most listened to inter-Miami podcast, providing you all the latest news, updates, analysis, opinions, inside information, general punditry, and much more. We have been listened to in more than 50 countries and counting. Happy Monday to you all. Happy start of the week to you all. My name is Franco Panizo. I am one third of your regular hosting crew. And we have another third of that team here present today to start the week with the in the first of what should be two podcasts. Yet again, we've been Firing them out and cranking them out as of late, but that's just because of how busy Inter Miami schedule has been. Of course, joining me is none other than Jose Cinco Armando, aka Island Jose. <laughs> <laughs> how is Island Jose's kingdom today? <laughs> it's good. <laughs> it's good. It's good. It's a sunny day. It's 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 a good time right now. Um, I, I like when you're. With a positive vibe, optimistic, just having fun. And I think we need that for you to be happy. Inter Miami needs to win. You seem to be a little bit more relaxed. So <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to be here and I'm happy to talk Inter Miami. Listen, when the team does well, I'm going to talk good things about them. If that's what I see on the field. And I saw very good things from the team this weekend in the match against the New York Red Bulls, which we will dive into in a little bit. Speaking of Island Jose and Island Jose's kingdom, I have to give two shout-outs. Last week, I was assigned to cover a state volleyball final, high school, for the Sun Sentinel. And I, I was assigned to do that before Inter Miami's game against DC United. So I went to the auditorium in Southwest Ranches to take in this final. It was between two Central Florida teams. All the South Florida teams were eliminated by the final. And when I sat down in the auditorium before the game or for the match kicked off or started, I keep using soccer terms, before it started, a person came up to me, a young man came up to me, and he said, hey, are you Franco? And I said, yes. And he was like, oh, I listened to the podcast. And he wasn't even, fr- well, he's from South Florida. He's from Coral Gables, but he lives in the Orlando area, if I'm not mistaken. His name was Nicholas Stone, and a, f- a former South Florida high school volleyball player so i thought that was pretty cool and then this week i was walking around dry pink stadium ran into a buddy said what's up and then afterwards when i was leaving the buddy i hear somebody else call my name and when i heard that i turned around and it was someone that said i listened to the podcast and i was like oh really i was like so what do you think who do you agree with myself with primo with jose he was like uh I tend to agree with you more. I never really agree with Jose, which I got a good, I got a good kick out of. So I think we're gonna retire Cinco. I think Island Jose is the way to go. I'm recruiting, recruiting. So <laughs> if anybody wants to jump in <laughs> Island Jose's kingdom, I'm, I'm happy to bring you in because it seems like you know you are running to people listening to the podcast, and I'm being left out here. So people, <laughs> come on. Uh, I, Island Jose is turning into Tom Hanks and Castaway with just a volleyball. Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, all right. We're here to talk about Inter Miami's latest game, which was a victory, a 2-0 to zero win against the New York Red Bulls. We will dive into that on this week's podcast or on this first edition of the podcast this week. We will dive into different performances, the substitutions, Phil Neville, Jose's return to a locker room setting for post-game interviews, And, of course, we will preview Wednesday's game against Orlando City in the U.S. Open Cup, the latest edition of the Sunshine Clásico, El Clásico del Sol. We will do that with Austin David, the Orlando Sentinel, Orlando City beat writer. And at the very end of the show, we will do our Q&A session and our final thoughts. So, Jose, I don't even have to ask you. It's a rhetorical question, but I will ask anyway. Are you ready? I am ready. (laughs) All right. Let's get to it. Okay, folks, so Inter-Miami returned home for the match against the New York Red Bulls on Sunday evening, and they picked up a 2-0 victory, which we're going to dive into in just a little bit. This was the lineup Phil Neville went with. It was that same 4-3-3. Drake Callender in goal once again. Back four from right to left. DeAndre Edlin, Damian Lowe, Ryan Saylor, and Christopher McVeigh. Your midfield triangle were Gregory as the six. 
Bryce Duke on the right, Gene Mott on the left. That's how they look to start, although they moved throughout the course of the game. And then your front three from right to left, Indiana Vasilev, Leonardo Campana, and Ariel Lasseter. Inter Miami gets goals from Ariel Lasseter in the 29th minute, 29th minute, and Robert Taylor in the 88th. And that is good enough for three points and a clean sheet against an Eastern Conference opponent. This was also Lewis Morgan's return. Familiar face. I don't I don't see anything from the fans or I didn't see a like a really big acknowledgement or nothing over the video board. Maybe I missed it. But anyway, Jose, your thoughts on this match, on the victory. What's your biggest analysis point or your biggest takeaway? Well, um my biggest takeaway is that, you know, again the team was able to to get the three points in in a match that was not necessarily as spectacular from them. I think, you know, they did not play at a high level. Um, I think especially early in the first half, they did struggle a lot with the ball. Um, Gregory got me surprised because um, he missed um, at least two or three easy passes that he usually is uh, uh, very accurate with. And, and he was not very good with the ball early on. And I think, um, you know, that was the case for at least the first half an hour in a consistent manner. Both teams were, were really struggling with the ball. Um, but, you know, the, the goal for, for the first goal, the, the Ari Lassiter goal, I think that was that that was a turning point because at, at that time in the game, I think it was it was pretty even. And I, I would have to go back to to check um, um, the, the stats. But I, I believe early on possession, um, the possession battle was won by by New York Red Bull. So. It was not an easy start, but they were able to overcome that. And, you know, in the end, they get that second goal. Um, I like uh, Miguel coming, coming on in the second half. And, and I like the attitude. I, I saw a good attitude from him. Um, and, and, and I was happy for him to see him, you know, just just get back into it and, and be someone that can actually provide something to the team and not, you know, just think about what he has been going through in terms of injuries and not being able to perform on the field. So I think overall, you know, just an okay performance. But, you know, the bottom line is they get three points and, and that's all that matters. So the disagreements on this edition of the podcast will start very early, apparently, because I think, my biggest takeaway, this was Inter Miami's best performance of the season. This was the best game that they've had of this season. I agree fully, and I said it to you in bits and pieces, although you weren't sitting directly next to me this time. Primo was in the in the press box. Inter Miami's first 20 25 minutes were very poor. A lot of hopeless long balls forward. They couldn't get out of their own half. They had very little possession because the Red Bulls just kept taking the ball and, and stuffing it down Inter Miami's throats over and over and over again. But around the 25th minute mark, Inter Miami started to get into a rhythm, into a better rhythm, started knocking the ball around a little bit better. Then comes the goal that you mentioned from Ariel Lassiter. And then after that, from that point forward, it was predominantly all Inter Miami. Red Bulls had a little moment here and there, but they weren't overly dangerous. Drake Callender was called upon to make a couple of saves, but again, Inter Miami, by and large, from where I was sitting, from how I saw the game, was in control. Something that I would be reluctant to say has happened much this season for the team. That they've been in control. There's been games where they've been up, and you don't necessarily feel like they're in control. In this game, the team transmitted to me, after that first 20-25 minutes, that they were in control. Again, Red Bulls had their chances. Inter Miami had some chances. They had quite a few chances, as a matter of fact, that they should have put away, and they didn't. That could have come back to bite them. It did not this time. Something that absolutely has to be improved. You put away your opponent earlier. Don't have to sweat it out until the 88th minute to get an insurance goal. But again, by and large, on the balance, for me, Inter Miami's best game this season. Something I brought up to you, and you strongly disagreed in the press box. I don't know if now you've had some time to think about it, time to maybe rewatch the game. I don't know if you have or not. Do you agree that it's been the best game, or do you still think, no, the first half was very poor? No, I cannot accept this performance as the best. It's Which one was better? Give me a game that was better than this one. I, I think the, the Atlanta United game was, was just a little bit better. I think that game, a two-one result. Remember that one? I think I think that one was a little bit better coming from behind. No, um, I would disagree with you because in that one they gave up 
several chances that Atlanta just did not put away. Like clear cut chances. Remember that was the I believe yeah. if our if my memory's correct and I I'm confident in this one. That was the first game that Gene Mota played as the six for Inter Miami, and he didn't yeah, he didn't have that defensive solidity, and they got they got carved open and gave up very clear cut chances. In this one, I don't you know there was the early save that Drake Callender made. There was a couple of later on that that weren't clear cut chances. They were just shots that were on frame. I don't recall the Red Bulls creating a plethora, an abundance, an excess of chances. Again, for me, the defense held up well, well they are and not, the attack. They are not a very good team. I mean, they have had good results, but they didn't show um, anything good enough. Who, the Red Bulls? Last- yeah, the Red Bulls, they were just an okay team. I mean, they were not they were not impressive last night. I think you would agree with that, right? I mean, but that's I think that's because Inter Miami played well. I think Inter Miami defended well. They created on, chances. They had chances. They had chances with the ball. It, you know, when they have the ball, when they create opportunities, and they were looking to that n- number 9 which, you know, Clemente was not as effective as he should have been. I mean, they had some talent. They do have some talent, but they didn't have their best game last night. They didn't but, have their best yeah. game, but I think no. Inter Miami did. I think. And look, you, you said the Rebels are not a good team. They're in fifth place in the Eastern Conference right yes. now. Yes, Atlanta. They, Atlanta's eighth. Come on now. Atlanta's come on, eighth. Come on, come on, come on now. Listen again. Remember last night? You know, we were thinking about this game, and we never thought that. The New York Red Bulls will overpower Inter Miami, and we knew the we knew the, the, where were they positioned in the standings. I don't know about that. Expect- I don't know about that. The, were, listen, the Red Bulls blowout. The, were you expecting? I wasn't. A ex- I was not expecting a blow, but I could have seen the Red Bulls easily win this game on paper going into it. The Red Bulls are higher up in the table. They were. They're a team that scored twenty goals this season going into the game. They had been undefeated on the road in MLS play. Up until this you game. Know, you know how it is in MLS. No, you no, You know no. how it is. No, no. Hold on, Jose. Look, right now, in the Eastern Conference, the Red Bulls have the most wins away from home in the Eastern Conference. They have, they have a five win, five, uh, excuse me, five win, one draw, and one loss record. Nobody else has a five, five wins. The next team is Cincinnati that has four wins, one draw, two losses. Inter Miami's record, just for comparison's sake, on the road... One win, one draw, four losses. So the Red Bulls, I mean, the Red Bulls are a respectable team on paper. And the way that Inter Miami played them yesterday, I don't think you're giving the Red Bulls enough credit. Maybe they're not to your liking from a soccer standpoint, which I would agree with you 100%, even when I covered them up close and personal during my time in the Northeast. And I would cover the games just from a personal preference. I did not like the soccer they played because they they just like to, like we talked about last week in the preview, <clears throat> the preview section with uh, Ivis Galarsep. They're a team that likes to high press. They like to create chaos. They like to win 50 50s. They like they like the mess. They they don't they don't they want to disrupt your rhythm, not let you play soccer. And they're very direct. They don't necessarily care about possession or about playing beautiful and aesthetically pleasing soccer. They're just and they high get energy. exposed all the time in the back, which is something that Inter Miami should have taken advantage of. But you touched on it already. So that's what I'm saying. So if Inter Miami had their chances up front that they did not put away. They defended well after those first 20, 25 minutes for the most part. Got a clean sheet and started controlling the game more. I don't know how. I don't know. That Atlanta game does not compare to this game in terms of. I don't know. I just, I just expect a little bit more. For me to call it the best game, I mean, I expect a little bit more. I expect a little bit more from the team. I think there could be you know, better games. There might be better games to come, but could it can it be the best game that they've played to this year? I would say yes. You say no. You say Atlanta's was better. I don't. I mean, okay. Yeah, to me, it was just just frustrating. Just frustrating to watch. You know, a lot of passes that were not that were easy ones and that were not completed. Um, I, I should say as well that I was a little bit frustrated with the referee the whole match, and maybe that took me away from my own analysis of the game, but. Um, I just, I don't know. I just when when you asked me in the press box, I, I I said no. That was my immediate reaction because it's 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 I don't know. There was, there was just some easy passes in the middle, and I thought they they both teams had trouble with the ball. And um, when uh, New York Red Bulls had possession, they were not creative enough. They were not able to find a way to at least get close to scoring. 
Um, and when it comes to Inter Miami, they score the first goal. The Ari Lassiter goal comes from an, an individual effort. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's his game. And the second goal comes from a counterattack. So um, it's it's a matter of uh, were they able to create out of the buildup? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think they created a lot out of the buildup, both sides. So it was just not a great game for me to watch. But again, I, I put a lot of value into the fact that Inter Miami and this is something that Phil has mentioned before, and not so many times I agree with this, but I think especially yesterday, last night, I should say, um, it, it's one of those games that maybe last year they don't they don't win, and they are winning those games right now, and that's that's very encouraging. That's very encouraging. It's I think it's early in the process. I would agree with that with Phil, which he has mentioned just a few, two weeks ago, I think he mentioned that they were still a work in progress. Well, if they are a work in progress and this is a right, a, a step in the right direction, I think, you know, winning those type of games is important, especially early on in a process. And, um, and, and yeah, this is, a, this is the typical game that in 2021, uh, Inter Miami w- would have had a lot of trouble with. Jose, we're going to move on here, but listen, just cause I'm saying it's the best game of the year. Doesn't mean there can't be a better game this year later on that there's not and i'm not saying there's not things that they need to improve on but jose think about the chances that they had bryce duke had one in the first half that he pushed wide that he should have put on frame leonardo campana had a glorious 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 look before halftime second half no first half had a glorious look in the first half and that he that he shoots with his his less preferred right foot and he skies it and sends it into into la familia yeah, but that's that's out of that's uh, that's out of poor defending. That's poor defending from from New York Red Bulls. They still have to that's, move the ball though. They still have to move the ball and get it around. Jose, not necessarily out of the build up. You know, that oh. was more like Victor Uyoa, second half has a clear cut opportunity to put the game away, and Ryan Mira makes a good save. Same thing again. Same thing because New York Red Bulls ex- is exposed constantly. Um, they they play one v one, and you know they get in trouble a lot. So I, I listen. I don't want to take. Uh, to to me, the credit w- winning this game goes to um, the team is growing and they are now able to win this type of games, and that's great. But don't come at me telling me this was beautiful to watch. Oh, it was a wonderful. I, I did not say it was beautiful to watch. I, within the next seven days because it was just outstanding play from Inter Miami. No, don't come to, to me with that because <laughs> I, they can be better and I will not accept this as a good performance. No. I, okay. Look, hard disagree there. I, I think when Phil Level looks at the and analyzes it again when he does in his coaching staff, I think they're going to see a lot of plus points that they'll be happy with. A lot of things that they'll be like, I like this. The defense got a clean sheet. That's positive, yes. That's, that's positive. The, sure. Re- the Red Bulls lost control. From the 25th, 30th minute on, it was Inter-Miami mm. Inter- had control of, of the game by and large, and Inter-Miami created chances. I mean, they, they checked off three of, the, three of the biggest boxes you could ask for. So, but we'll move on. That doesn't, that doesn't make it the game memorable or something that will never... Uh, I mean, I'm not saying it's memorable. I'm not saying, Jose, this is a game that's epic. And I'm saying, for me, this is the best game that we've seen from Inter-Miami this season. That does not mean that there can't be a better game later on or that there's not things that they can improve on. 100% there are. I agree with you fully there. But from what I saw in this game compared to all the other games before, this was the best game I've seen from Inter Miami. I don't know. Maybe things are changing and my expectations are getting are going places that they shouldn't be going. Maybe that's the case. I maybe, don't know. Maybe. Although, although you were the one giving me stick for... for a Usually my expectations on this team are very low. Very, very low. From preseason, from the preseason pot we did, I remember you saying that they would make it to the playoffs. And uh, you were thinking playoffs since the first day, and I was the one trying to bring you down to earth. <laughs> and, uh, no, see, that's... It's what, that... right now, it's working the other way around. So something must have happened in the last few weeks around this pod. Jose, you, I, I can't believe you keep saying that, that I'm the one that said that they're going to make the playoffs because I didn't. I predicted. You did. That's no, I didn't. Jose, oh, my goodness. Jose. You were playoffs. Jose. You were thinking playoffs. Jose. I when pre- they make you it to the playoffs. When they, play, when they no, are see, in the playoffs. You're, no, you're talking remember. nonsense now because we, we both predicted with Primo on the preview pod you and I both had Inter Miami 10th, 11th, or 9th, somewhere around yeah, there. I had 10th. I 100% had 10th. 
That was the last part of preseason. I'm talking about the first part of the year. You were the talking. The first part of the enough. year was talking about how that is the bar. And I can't believe we're still having this argument in almost the end of May, early June. That is where the bar was at. That is what they would be judged against. And that's what they will be judged against. That's all I was saying. I never thought in preseason, I and I still do not think today that this team will make the playoffs. I, ins- I will continue to hold my belief that this is not a playoff team, even despite all the good things I just said about them in the last game, in this in the last few minutes. I don't think it's a playoff team. Maybe they will be, but I was not saying that they were a playoff team. You misunderstood me completely there. That's what I said the bar is at. That's what they would judge themselves against. That's what we had to judge them against. Because this is not a, an expansion team or anything of the like. This was a third-year team, completely revamped. Yes, it was younger. Yes, they had sanctions. But the playoffs were still the bar that they would. That's the, that's the minimum bar you could settle at. Even even if you're an expansion team, that's what you settle. Or excuse me, that's what you strive for is the playoffs. That's that's the bare minimum that you can do. But anyway, let's let's stay on focused on this game. Let's talk about the substitutes from Phil Neville because they made an impact in this game. You touched on Gonzalo Higuain. We mentioned Victor Uyoa. Robert Taylor, as I said before, got the second goal. His first four inter Miami. The substitutes helped in a big way. What did you think of those players coming into the game and helping to, I won't say make a difference because Inter Miami was already ahead, but to helping close out this win with another goal and continuing to defend well and get that clean sheet? Well, you know, the the the, the, the one thing that, you know, caught my attention as well is how much experience you brought in from, from the bench, right? I mean, that's that's very good. That's very good. I mean, this is, I think, Prior to the start of the regular season, we might have thought that Robert Taylor, I think even Victor Yoa and Gonzalo Higuain should be starters on this team. That 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 would have been a safe bet at that time. Um, now you bring them off the bench, you bring a lot of experience, you bring players that can close things out, which is something that it's it's hard to find in in the US, you know, a team that it's not going to be overly aggressive and end up losing the ball trying to get that second second goal and close things out and then in the end you end up drawing the game 1-1. That's what usually happens. Well, when you bring players with plenty of experience that know exactly how to win games, then, you know, you have that sense of comfort and I think that's exactly what they brought to the game and eventually without risking it all, they were able um, to combine each other into getting that second and final goal, which sealed the deal. I completely agree that they had opportunities and they should have put away those opportunities, but I think that's another topic. The reality is that players are coming in, and um, I have to give credit to, to Iwain because I thought he would be a lot more frustrated. And um, He looked frustrated before the game, sitting just sitting there on the ball while everybody was doing other warm-up drills. If you haven't seen that image or those that video, I tweeted it out on, on obviously on Twitter, at Franco Panizo. Very weird. I've never seen that before. Have you ever seen that before? Uh, from him? No, in general. Just like, have you ever seen in a general? player? Uh, yeah, I've seen some crazy things. I've seen some crazy things. Yeah, I've seen that before. So, something similar. Maybe not exactly the same, but something similar. Yeah. Um, listen, I, I think I think they they play their part, right? I mean, um, they did Victor, their job. They did their job. Yeah, I think Victor Yoa. You know, he's he's getting back as well. You know, you, you, you can see that, especially, you know, after preseason, I, I, I can I can remember vividly Victor Yo in preseason. He was playing at a high level before the injury. He was playing really, really well. I really like what I saw from him. Um, the leadership. I remember I think it was the DC United game that you guys you guys were not there. Um, I really like what I saw from Victor that day. And, and I thought he's going to have a good year. And then, unfortunately, of course, the injuries happened. But um I think he's, he's just trying to get back. And, and obviously, he has a lot of competition in the middle right now. So it's going to be tough for him to get more minutes. But he, he's going to be there whenever the team needs him. And, and Gonzalo, I think, you know, it's 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 a similar scenario. Um, obviously, there's so many things around um, a player like Gonzalo Huayin, you know, the, the um, on and off the field situations where, you know, you have a player that has been at the highest level and he wants to play, and then you have Leo Campana. Do you change things when you sense that Gonzalo Wayne is getting back where he where he wants to be, getting back into that rhythm? Um, how can you keep him in the bench? I, there are so many things, but I think for um, 
for the game against New York, I think they, they played their part and, and and they helped the team achieve the goal, which you know it was to get three points, and, and, and they did it last night. So I, I don't think we can ask more from them. I agree. They're fully, obviously, when you bring in substitutes, you either want them to maintain the level that the team is demonstrating without them or improve it. That's the ideal scenario and Inter Miami was able to do that. They the, the players that came in maintained it and improved it. You know, the other two subs were Amey Mabika and Robbie Robinson. Amey Mabika helped close it out. He's back from his injury. He helped close out the game by slotting in there at the back and setting up the five-man back line. And he looked good in his, his very brief spell. Robbie Robinson, probably of the bunch for me, was probably the weakest one. He chipped in and contributed, contributed defensively. But with the ball and when he had moments to attack left me in the press box kind of shaking my head a little bit because you know there were times where he could have gone one-on-one and used his speed and instead he slowed the play down trying to cut on his right foot the, the things that we've been critical of of Robbie Robinson on this podcast well, in the past so he gets brought in just to you know to be the energy guy right to run a lot run keep running continue running run until the full 90 and then you know you have the other experienced players that have to do something else than run be a little bit you know, more creative with the ball, hold on to it. So I think there are roles. Yeah, but he has to do more than that, especially when he's in one-on-one situations in the counterattack that plays to his strengths. Instead of cutting back on that right foot and and killing the whole momentum and and slowing play down, either take take that player on yourself, use your speed, use your pace, and create a shot. Because look, this game, Inter Miami won. I've talked very good things about it, of course. They got the 2 0 in the 88th minute, Jose. If the Red Bulls found a moment of magic, if they found a fluky, a, a fluky bounce or a lucky deflection or ricochet, they could have tied this game up and we're talking completely different about the game. So, you know, well, obviously no. obviously for Inter Miami, putting the game away earlier is something that they'll strive to do, right? I, I just named everything I think Phil Nell and his coaching staff will look at and say, we like this, this, and this. I think one thing that they'll look at and say... We didn't like this so much. That's something we can improve on is putting a game away earlier. And that maybe that's the next step for this team. And if they can get to that step, then we're talking a completely different Inter-Miami because then we're talking Inter-Miami that's taking leads and in positions to add to that lead as they were in this game. Which Yeah, but I wouldn't put that on Robbie Robinson because I wouldn't expect Robbie to be that guy for this team. I would put it maybe on Nari Lassiter. He had a chance, a 1v1 as well, and he couldn't finish. So I would expect Lasseter to score. Robinson's then... an attack. Robinson's a winger. He's an attacking player. He's he's yeah, expected. Maybe. He's expected to create goals and assists. That's what he's expected to do. In addition yeah. to other things, but primarily he's expected to go score goals and assists. So whether it's off the bench, whatever. Look again defensively, he did a he did an, an acceptable job in the attack. Not so much, but again, just by and large, the substitutes for me, they got the job done. Iguain played some nice through balls in. He helped set up that that final insurance. Oh, excuse me, that final goal, the insurance strike, with a nice through ball slipped in there to Robert Taylor. Robert Taylor, with the heads-up play, lays it across the 18-yard box to a wide-open Victor Ulloa, who I thought, in my head, from the press box, I was like, this is Victor Ulloa's moment, this will be his first goal with Inter-Miami. But he had missed a clear-cut one-on-one look earlier. Ryan Mira, the Red Bulls goalkeeper, had stopped him on a one-on-one look earlier. So you could tell Victor Ulloa didn't have the confidence. He was like a little hesitant. He he tried to you know get Brian Mir to, to give himself up one way or the other, and he couldn't. So he just laid it back off to Robert Taylor, and Robert Taylor slots it home for the the simple finish. And you know we got to speak to Victor Ulloa after the game in the press, excuse me, in the locker room, and we talked to him about about the assist. And you know he even said he's like I should have put my chances away at the very end after he was asked a bunch of other questions I, I jokingly said to him something along the lines of like I thought you had it and he said he responded he's like I won't say the exact word he used an expletive and he's like man I should have scored and then he saw Robert Taylor walking to come to do the interview with us and he goes well I just wanted Robert Taylor to get to get his first goal with the team so <laughs> <laughs> so a little a little joke there obviously but again he he should have put one of those two chances away, if not both of them. They were clear-cut opportunities. Obviously, he's not a, an attacking player, but you still expect him to, to try to put one of those away because he was in glorious, glorious opportunities. But again, overall, the substitutes from Phil Neville, they did the job. I think this is Gonzalo Higuain's role going forward. Something he touched on afterwards. You asked him about it. I asked him about it. 
and he, and he shed some light. I, I thought he'd be frustrated, but he was open and candid and said, you know, every player wants to play. You know, that's a question for the coach. But he's gone through this and, and things of that nature. I mean, what did you take away from what he said post game? Well, you know, I think I, I think it's okay with the situation right now because of the injury situation that that um, that has been affecting affecting him. You know, just being just just being unable to to train is something that he understands is going to set him back. And you know, it, it's it's not good timing for him. Obviously, it's good for the team, but it's not good timing for him that Leo Campana went on a run during that time. And I think he understands that. And I think he, he would be frustrated um, if it happened the other way around, right? If he started scoring and then somebody else comes in and takes his spot, he wouldn't be happy about it. So I think he's mature enough to understand that. But at the same time, I think he's working hard to get back to the level um, to, to, to the level that he wants to be, right? This, you know, to be maybe close to 100%, as close as he can get. Now, the question is, what is going to happen when he feels he's ready to start and he's ready to play full 90 minutes and when he feels he's ready to start scoring again and, and, and find some consistency in his game? What is going to happen at that time? Because I don't think he's just going to lay back and wait until Campana gets injured or stops scoring. I think he will demand a spot in the starting lineup. And you know, as that's just the nature of the game. It, it has happened before, not only with him, but top strikers, when they feel they are back, they, they try to regain their spot. And, and I think that's where the challenge is going to come to field, because right now I think he understands, understands what the situation is, but I think that might change uh, as weeks come by. Jose, listeners can't see me, but my eyes are... A little, no, I won't say glazed over, but they're a little droopy right now. And I have a really face on. Like, really? you actually buying that? Like, yes, he's coming back from injury. Yes, that's that's clear. But to say that he's not really all that fit or not ready, I don't agree with that. He played 45 minutes against Tormenta, and that was a few, a couple of weeks ago. He doesn't need to tell me that he's not fit. He doesn't look like it. He doesn't look like it. He doesn't look fit. Jose, maybe we should the ball. When, when has he? he when has he? Look, when has he looked fit while he's been with Inter Miami? Well, you know he has. I think in better shape. I don't know if fit 100 percent fit because I, I I'm not a physical trainer, but um, I can tell when a player is, you know, 100 percent and when he's not. And what he makes you think up. he's not 100 percent? Well, just the way I see him run, and the, the way I see him get touches with the ball. Not into the rhythm, rhythm of competition. He's not 100%. Jose, He's not 100%. Jose, that's how he looked before the injury. He can be a lot better. I, I don't think he can be much better. I don't think so. I think, again... He can be a lot better. If he plays as a nine, he can be a lot better. And maybe that's the one question that we missed yesterday. And something that should be asked. But thanks to the beauty of the locker room, we might have another opportunity. But that's the one question. Because it is very clear that they need him to play as a nine, and he likes to play as a ten, and that's why he struggled. And that's the image that you have of Iwain struggling as a ten. No, Jose, I think physically, and we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, maybe maybe a few weeks ago, maybe a little bit more than that. That I think this is just all Iwain can give you from a physical standpoint. Sure, from a technical standpoint and from a positional standpoint, there are things he could do better. But I think from a physical standpoint, this is it. This is his role. This is how he will finish out much of this season and probably his career. Because physically, he just doesn't have that much more to give. He just His body just doesn't respond in that way. He just doesn't give it. And something I said a few weeks ago, we need to adjust our expectations of Iguain. Yes, he gets paid a boatload of money. The MLS Players Association released the salaries last week, something we'll touch on in the final segment as well. But I just don't think that his, he's going to give you all that much physically anymore. I think he's going to be used as a spot bench player on occasion when games call for it and with the idea that he can pick out passes or score a goal here or there. But if you're going to think that he's going to get so much more fit that he's going to be running around and giving you a lot more... At this point in his career, I don't see that. I think this is oh. it. I think this. I think they look. I said this on another pod uh, again a few weeks ago. I think you know how some players say 
when they retire, I'm leaving the game before the game leaves me. They usually say, you know, not usually, but some people say, some players say something along those lines. I think the game has left Gonzalo Higuain before he left the game. I think he probably is going to end up retiring too late as opposed to too soon. That's just, uh, that's just my opinion. I don't know. If you expect him to outrun Emerson and, you know, that's uh, that's that's not that's not the way to to judge whether he's um, he's a hundred percent or not. What I'm telling you is that he doesn't look a hundred percent because he's not as effective with the ball. Um, obviously, you know, physically he needs to be. He's not going to be a, a speedster or the um, you know a, a guy that's going to lead the counterattack. He's not going to be that guy for you, but he can be better. I mean, he. You, you can do better than what he's showing right now. And, and I think he will. I think he will. So He can be sharper, but can he be more fit? Uh, that's what you said initially, and I don't think so. Yes, I think he can. I think he okay. can. Okay. All right. We'll see, but I don't I don't think so. I don't think so. I think at this point, this is who Gonzalo Higuain is. And that's you know, just... to add something to, to the conversation as well, you know, the time in which he came to the game last night, was to, was not exactly the the, the best situation. I, I wasn't I wasn't too convinced of him coming in. I will I will say that you're on the podcast. I was like, is Phil Neville making a mistake here, taking away a bit of a bit of d- defense from the team as they were trying to protect the one to zero lead? Look, it paid off. Kudos to Phil Neville for getting it right. Kudos to what Charlie doing for performing. But in the moment, I was like, this is risky. Right. This is risky. Yeah, and still, and, and it's it's not a good scenario for him to show whether he's, you know. How close is he to 100 percent? And that's why I asked him in the locker room if he was close to 100 percent. And he couldn't he didn't really answer like, yes, no. He went on and and explained what he has been going through in the last uh, couple of weeks. But um, I think that scenario in which Inter Miami was basically looking for the counterattack opportunities, that's not necessarily where you want to put Gonzalo Higuain. So um, it's hard to judge based on what I saw last night, but I can tell you uh, that, and this is from experience, um, that he doesn't look 100%. He doesn't look 100%. Okay. I, I, I'll, close out, I'll close out this thought. I'll round out the, the thought here with this. This season for Inter Miami up until now, there has been an antes y un después. There's been a before and an after. The before was when Gonzalo Higuain was the starting striker or the star or the starter on this team. The after has been since Campana took his place in the lineup, and the team has looked miles better. So I don't know. Again, I don't agree with you that I think he's going to get much more fit, and he's going to can he be better? Sure, but I don't think he's going to give you a whole lot more than what we're seeing right now. Because even before the injuries, the antes, the before. Yeah, we, we didn't see a whole lot from him, in my opinion. I think we're, but... I think we're gonna have to judge judge him um, based on what the situation uh, that he gets put in. I, let me let me see if I can rephrase this in a, in a sense that um, I can compare it as well to situations that it, we have seen throughout the year um, with Campana, and you know the missed opportunity. Maybe this game is is, is the right example. Campana misses that opportunity. I want to see Wayne in that same situation. I want to see the team set up Wayne in that same situation. But he doesn't play that way, Jose. He doesn't play that way. And you, we, can, we, can, we can bang our heads against the wall every week and say he should be in the box. He should be a number nine. He should. But if he's not there and he doesn't do it, then, he, then how can the teammates set him up? How can teammates set someone up that's not in the box on a consistent basis? I think it goes back to the same conversation that we that we I think we had this conversation from day one as well. I mean, Phil needs to go to Gonzalo and tell him I need you to play as a nine. Don't move from a box. But if he I doesn't do it, then what can you do? You then what do you do? Exactly the same way. I want you to replace Leo Campana. But if he doesn't do that on the field once he's on on the pitch, then what? Then what do you do? You can't do anything. That's just that's again. We'll leave it there with with regards to Iguain, but. I don't think we're going to see a whole lot more. I think, again, occasional weapon off the bench, which something, again, we talked about a few weeks ago. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that's 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 a normal progression for some players in their careers that have been high-level players. When, when they start losing some of their 
athletic ability, and Gonzalo Higuain, again, was never the most athletic. When they start losing that, maybe they have to be players that come off the bench. And it's happened to plenty of players around the world of football that have been very, very high-level players. That They become super subs, for lack of a better phrase. And I think that's what Gonzalo Higuain will be, a weapon off the bench primarily for this team for much of the rest of the season. I don't think we'll see a much more fitting way. But anyway... Let's continue on because there's a few more players I want to quickly, quickly touch on. One is Ariel Lasseter, who scored a nice goal there to open the scoring, help change the tide of the game or push the tide into Miami's favor. Someone that you have said since Mm -hmm. preseason was going to help this team. I wasn't as convinced. I thought that he would not be a regular starter with the goal that he scored in this game, plus the two against Tormenta FC. He's got, I think, a spot locked down in the lineup. So it's looking good for uh, for you in our non-bet bet because we didn't actually place the bet officially. But anyway, it's looking good for you. I think he's, he's looking like a safe bet now to make the 25. So I will be wrong at the end of the year. And you will Thank be you. right. What did you see? Thank you. What did you see? For, it's okay because I've got, I got, I've got one coming up for you after this. What, <laughs> what did you see from at Lasseter in this game? Quickly, Jose. Um, you know, I, I, I saw the, the exact same player that I envisioned from, from the start of the season, from, from preseason. Um, I think, you know, his, his, uh, he's very good in the one B one and he's capable of, of changing a game, but he's capable as well of missing opportunities. And, uh, um, right, he's not, he's not, the, he's not the most lethal finisher, right? He's not the most right, lethal finisher. Right. So what I'm trying to say is that, you know, just you just need to understand the type of player that he is right now. He might develop into something a lot better. You know, he might, you know, work on 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 his finishing, and then he might be, you know, uh, um, getting closer to to the top. But as of right now, you know, you have to celebrate when he scores and when he when he's a difference maker. But when he's not able to finish, then you need to remember that you know he's he's that type of player. But he will always give you effort. And, you know, when when he misses a chance, it's not necessarily because he doesn't care. He will never stop running. He will always be, I think, you know, uh, a guy that as well looks to set up his teammates. And I think he he shown that uh, he did show that last night as well in the game against New York. So I think he's just that type of player. That's that energy, energy type player. And and that I think, you know, it's exactly what Inter Miami needed this year. You know, because he's a player that needed minutes, needed to gain some consistency. He saw an opportunity in Inter Miami, and Inter Miami was glad to give him an opportunity as well because of all the sanctions and all the situations that we all know about. So I think this scenario is working really well for both, and I just hope that he can continue to work. You know, so that he can um, get a little bit better in those things that he needs to work on, and 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 maybe he'll he'll play even a bigger factor in the rest of the regular season but so for right now i think it's it's, it's a scenario that i thought he will he will run into here in south florida right now he looks very confident to me right now he looks or is doesn't look he is to me the number one winger on this team like if, if phil neville's taking out his lineup sheet and putting in the names ariel lasseter is the first winger on there he's probably number one on the depth chart for inter miami because even Indiana Vasilev, who's come in and in the last couple of weeks and gotten some starts, still hasn't fully convinced me. I've never fully been convinced by by Indiana Vasilev. Ro- uh, Robbie Robinson, it's clear that I don't really rate him all that much. I think he, he's got a lot to improve. Emerson Rodriguez, we talked about last week, hasn't shown a whole lot. Edison Ascona hasn't really gotten minutes. So right now, Ariel Lasseter has one of those wing spots locked down. The other one... A little more up for grabs, but a confident showing from him. The way he consistently went at defenders, did his step overs, which at times I was like, all right, doesn't seem like the best decision at times, but it shows a confident player. It shows a player that's willing to try to make things happen, to go at players that gives the team some of that verticality, some of that direct play when they're trying to counterattack, some speed, and he's a little more dangerous than the other wingers in the final third, even though he's not the best goal scorer. So in this one, good, good one on good individual play. Like you said, took his defender in a one on one situation, did the step overs, cut to the right, and then hit a shot that you said deflected. I don't know. 
I don't know if it deflected. I don't know if it deflected, but it found the bottom far corner all the same and a heck of a goal. His first MLS goal for Inter Miami, the two against Tormenta were in the Open Cup. So definitely a plus for Inter Miami that he's looking more confident because Inter Miami is a team that relies on successful wing play, be it service or goals. Drake Callender is the next player I want to touch on. And we won't go too deep into this because we just did it, you and I, on the last pod. If you haven't heard it, we did a podcast late last week ahead of the game against New York Red Bulls. And we went in detail on this. I'll just ask you this, Jose. Has Drake Callender, with this latest performance, yeah. done anything to change your mind in terms of the argument that he's the number one goalkeeper? Because I, I am fully even more convinced now that he's the number one goalkeeper for Inter Miami. No, I think he's having. Uh, I think he had one good save, in, in um, last night. I think it was one. What was the I think score? It was what was the score from, at that time? I th- was it one do you, zero? Do you remember? No, it was zero zero. It was zero zero. Zero zero, oh. and uh, and uh, and the Red Bulls uh, had a clear opportunity to score, and he makes a good save by cutting down the angle, making himself big, and he thwarts that danger. Into Miami scores shortly thereafter. That okay, and again, that's trying- that's where the goalkeeper he's making saves. I'm are, that... to think that you're Drake Callender's agent. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. Hey, look, I like that because I call you Island Jose. I call. I used to call uh-huh. Primo David Beckham's long lost cousin and, and Phil Neville's Phil Neville's lawyer. So I will take it that you call me Drake Callender's agent. I liked it. I like it. I like. You were even I like asking Iwaina about Drake Callender. <laughs> you, that, you have that's... to. I wanted to. I wanted to hear what someone that's played at a high level. That's one of the referentes. One of the lead figures on this team had to say about it. That's why I asked Gonzalo Wayne, and he had nothing but positives to say about Drake Callender. Well, I ask him about a striker, not about a goalkeeper. He knows nothing about a goalkeeper. What? what wait, he knows nothing about a goalkeeper? Wait, so you're telling me that he's played at the highest levels and he doesn't know anything about goalkeepers? I'm not saying he knows about being a goalkeeper, but he knows he's seen goalkeeper. He's been around the game his whole life, Jose. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? Uh, I, ju- I, I, I guess, you know... Island Jose's maybe, kingdom is in full effect you're, right now. You're... Within your agent role, I, you kind of have to have the top, the, the top paid t- player on the team to support your player. So I, I think that makes uh, sense. Not, that's fine. I'm, that's fine. I'll take it. Hey, I'll take it. You want to call Drake Collins? Because you know, you, know, you know how in uh, American sports lexicon, they'll be like, oh, your guy or your boy. You know how they say that? So if you're calling Drake Collins my boy because I think he's on a very good run of form as the number one goalkeeper, I'll take that. I, I, I'm absolutely convinced he's the number one goalkeeper in Inter Miami's depth chart right now. He has done nothing, nothing to lose that spot. That's not a, a strike okay. against Nick. That's not a strike against Nick Marsman. Just Drake calendar has been playing so well. He has done nothing to lose that spot. He will start on Wednesday for sure because the Open Cup tournament has been his. He started both games in that tournament. I expect him to start on Wednesday. We'll see on the weekend against the Portland Timbers if Nick Marsman is back in the lineup. I would say if both are healthy... He doesn't. I think he's an excellent backup. And if there's some value to him in the market, then I think Inter Miami should look into it. Maybe bring another player that can help you. You? No. What are you? Jose. Jose. I can't believe you're saying that. Jose. That That would make a lot of sense. No. They would would trade Nick Marsman before they trade Drake Callender because Drake Callender is younger. Drake Callender is cheaper. Drake Callender can be part of a longer term future. You didn't hear my you didn't hear the first part of my statement. If there's if there is value in the market for Drake Islander, then think about it. There's no value for Nick Marsman in the in the in the market. I think, you know, you do not Nick trade Mar- Drake, there's no way you trade Drake Calendar right now. No way. It's With how just, he's playing, no way. Well, I'm just saying. I'm just saying it's five games. If somebody, you know, it's uh, it's overreacting in the oh league. Oh my stuff, goodness gracious! You might, you might go, you might go. With I don't that. know. I don't know what he has to do. I don't know how many more games he has to play to convince you. But that's fine. We, 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 we... I'm saying he's good. I'm saying he's a good backup. I'm saying he's good. So when will you be convinced that he's a starter? Because last time it was like, oh, he's got to keep, he's got to keep playing, he's got to keep playing well. Again, again, second clean sheet in a row for him. Inter Miami doesn't get a ton of clean sheets. That's obviously not just a goalkeeper thing. But the goalkeeper does play an instrumental part in it. It's not like Drake Callender's recording these clean sheets being inactive because the defense in front of him is a brick wall. He's having to make good saves to great saves to get them. But okay, we'll leave it there. You clearly don't think he's the number one yet. I don't know how many more performances he has to put forth for you to start maybe changing your mind. Hey, look, I, hey, I, I took it on board. I said Ariel Lasseter, he's probably going to get that those 25 starts this season in meaningful Thanks. matches. But see, you're still not budging, but that's okay. That's okay. All right, let's move on quickly. 
I wanted to talk about two more players, but there's one question about one of the players I want to talk about, which is Bryce Duke, so we'll leave that for the Q&A session. Last player to talk about quickly, Leonardo Campana did not score in this game, but what did you think about the Ecuadorian striker? I thought he had a very good game. Again, showed confidence, battled, scrapped, had had a couple of sombreros where he flicked the ball over a couple of defenders' heads and kept it kept control. I think he might have even got a nutmeg pass in there somewhere, so... Very good game, again, from Leonardo Campana. In my opinion, the type of number 9 Inter Miami needs and has needed, he continues to play well for me. Obviously, he missed that golden and that's look. The line. Yes, and that's the bottom line. He missed the chance that he needed to put away. And that's how you judge strikers. But I would agree with you overall. A good game, you know, a, a, a so- solid performance. I think he's running higher in confidence. But, you know, you need to score those chances. And I think he, he'll be the first one to tell you that, yes, um, everything is nice, nutmeg, sombreritos and everything, very nice, very fancy and all, but goals, you know, the, the strikers, they, they need to score. But, yeah, good performance, very, very good performance. He absolutely needed to put that one away, absolutely. And I think when he receives the ball in the penalty area, his plant leg slips a little bit, and that – makes for the ball or that allows the ball to get away from him and then when he tries to wrap his foot around it his less preferred right foot the technique is off then because when he's sliding he doesn't get his body over the ball his knee over the ball his he's leaning back instead which is poor technique by and large and that normally leads to raised shots or high shots which is what ends up happening he shoots the ball over the crossbar and into the la familia stands there in the north end of the stadium Definitely a major strike against him in this one. Probably the biggest strike or the biggest mistake or error that he's had thus far for Inter Miami. But still think he had a good game. And let's not forget, he set up your boy, Ariel Lasseter, with a golden chance in the second half after out-muscling U.S. Men's National Team center back Aaron Long, who is as physical a center back as there is in this league, normally wins his duels. Leonardo Campana impressively got on the end of a Damian Law low long ball, held off Aaron Long, and fed Ariel Lasseter, whose sh- ensuing shot was saved by Ryan Mira. So let's not forget that. Again, overall for me, very good performance from Leonardo Campana. But let's leave it there for now. We will take a quick break. We will come back afterwards and preview the Sunshine Clásico, El Clásico del Sol, against Orlando City in the U.S. Open Cup. We will do that with Austin David. Of the Orlando Sentinel, and we will do that after this. We got to we got to Orlando on uh, Wednesday now, and we will probably have to make two or three changes. But we're going there to win, we're going there with our strongest team. We can only pick eighteen on Wednesday, which which means that five or six are going to miss out probably on Wednesday. Robbie obviously suspended, uh, and uh, we've got players now really really happy with what's going on. All right, everybody, it's time to preview Inter Miami's next game, which is against rivals Orlando City at Exploria Stadium on Wednesday night in a win-or-go-home U.S. Open Cup round of 16 match. Orlando City will welcome the South Florida side in what should be a very intense matchup, one I'm looking forward to, and one that I call the Sunshine Clásico, El Clásico del Sol. Joining me to preview that game, although I know he's not a big fan of that nickname, (laughs) <laughs> is Austin David of the Orlando Sentinel. He is there, Orlando City and Orlando Pride beat writer. Austin, thank you so very much for joining us. How are you doing today? I am doing pretty good. A uh, little tired because I just flew back from Austin where Orlando played their last game. But uh, yeah, ready for a, a very fun-filled week of soccer. There's there's two Orlando City and an Orlando Pride game all within the next six days. Well, let's jump into that first one for Orlando City because it's against Inter Miami. Very important game for both teams. They're both gunning for some silverware in this tournament. Orlando City, like you said, coming off a game against Austin. What can you tell us about this version of Orlando, this Orlando City team, these Lions? What have you seen from them so far in 2022? It's a team that's turned the page a little bit on what it was. Nani's no longer with the team. But they've kept a core of the roster from the last season or two. What can you tell us about Orlando City in 2022 so far? Man, I I just can't wrap my head around this team yet. Uh, <laughs> it is it has been the the weirdest up and down team 
that I've seen the last couple of years where like they'll go out and win road games that maybe they shouldn't and then lose home games that they should win. Like early in the season, they lost to FC Cincinnati, who was arguably better, um, but they got shut out by FC Cincinnati, which, yeah, that, that was just a weird game. And then, um, you know, you go on the road and beat Toronto, who they've never beaten Toronto in Toronto before. So that was something a little bit different. And then whatever the heck happened on Sunday night, which was also very hard to wrap my head around because there was just a lot that happened in the second half. First off, Orlando City took a 2 nothing lead against the best offensive team in the league and was actually holding them to like hardly any chances throughout that first half. And the second half comes along, they get two red cards, a uh, mysterious corner kick at the very end of the game, which led to a uh, game-tying goal for Austin. Um, never seen Oscar Pereja that upset after a game from uh, when we were doing the press conference. I was, I was sitting in the room with him, and um, yeah, he, he just kind of was like, he was over it. It, it, was, it was really, um, you could see the emotion and, and the toll that, that game took on them which makes it interesting for this game on Wednesday because they flew black they flew back last night so they got in about midnight 1 a.m. 2 a.m. Uh, eastern time they're off today they train tomorrow night and then they play Miami so there's not too much time to kind of look past what just happened and also, considering that they played down two men for about 30 minutes, the bodies are going to be very, very heavy. Like, the legs are going to be heavy. And I expect, I expected rotation coming into the game. I, I may expect a little bit more considering what just transpired this past weekend. Now, you touched on Orlando City and how they may approach Wednesday. But before we dive a little bit more into that, Orlando City right now, even though they've been inconsistent, there's six wins, three draws, and four losses. 16 goals scored, 17 scored against. That's good enough for third place in the Eastern Conference right now, which the Eastern Conference, maybe that speaks to the Eastern Conference not being all that <laughs> great. But nonetheless, Orlando City's up there. Who have been some of the players in this inconsistent start that have played well more consistently? Who who are some of the danger men that... Maybe play as from the start, maybe from the bench, but that could be impactful on on Wednesday night. Yeah, and that and that kind of goes with it. Like the inconsistent team also has inconsistent players. So there's players that will that they've shown up in games and then completely invisible other games. And and there there really is no explanation for why these these things happen. Uh, they they just kind of. I really don't know how to explain it. Like there, <laughs> there, there is a game, like you can go from game to game, and like Jean Moutinho, for example, he'll have a great game like the week before, and then the next week he'll be having about six turnovers in the defensive half of the field, and why that happens, and then he'll come back again the next week and be perfectly fine again. I don't know, and um, that that's kind of been the the struggle of this Orlando City team is that um, they'll have games like the game they played against the Columbus crew a couple of weeks back. Everything was clicking. Everything was working. Um, and then you'll have a game against the New York Red Bulls where absolutely nothing is working and they completely get dominated in their own home stadium. So with that, I would say the most consistent players would be Pedro Galese, considering that. Yay, Peru, is, yay. Yeah, I think you'd be like that. Um, he, he took a couple knocks last night. Hey. Um, stayed down for for a little bit. Don't but, say that. Um, Don't say that. They got the repechaje, the playoff I game know. coming up. Don't say that. Don't say well, that. You're I'm, gonna, I'm gonna scare all the Peruvians in South Florida. I'm just giving you a, a small <laughs> heads up, just in case. But he should be fine. He mm -hmm. he, he saw out the game. Um, but he's been the, probably the most consistent player, considering that he, you know, you know what to expect from him. He is a great goalkeeper. I would say probably one of the top five goalkeepers in MLS. Mm -hmm. You know, bias notwithstanding, but. He has been a game changer for Orlando City's back line, especially with Antonio Carlos being out. Yeah. Uh, he tore his hamstring back in April, and since then, Rodrigo Schlegel has been in the center back role. And Rodrigo's done a, a good job 
but comparatively to Antonio Carlos, who is a game changer in the back line, um, they've they've allowed some chances that wouldn't normally happen, and Pedro has stepped up in a big way to deny a lot of those chances. So I would say he is probably one of the biggest contributors to it. Um, surprisingly, it is uh, I would say in the midfield, Cesar Araujo has been one of the the most consistent players. Uh, last night, being Sunday night, uh, probably the outlier, considering that he was turning balls over in the, his own uh, defensive third and also got a straight red for kicking out on Alex Ring. But outside of that game, he's probably been the most consistent player in the team. He has been a dominant ball winner in the midfield. He's a guy that you can kind of rely on to just stop plays going through the middle almost acting like that third center back playing as more of a six who right. just stays back in, in between the defensive uh center backs and and just breaks up plays and he's also really good at winning fouls he's the the league leader in fouls one and he's he just finds ways to to really piss off players apparently because they <laughs> just keep chopping him down he averages like i think four or five fouls uh, suffered per game. So all things considered, I think for a 21 year old who's new to the league, he signed the U 22 initiative to come to Orlando this past off season. He's been a, a very big surprise because he's, he is outseated Sebas Mendez, who in his own right is very good. He's a starter for the Ecuadorian national team. And well, Sebas hasn't seen much of the field this year. He, he comes in in spurts, but it's basically right. been him. It's been Araujo and Junior Urso in that midfield. Um, but lately, Orlando has had uh, a lack of depth in the winger position. So Benji Michel uh, twisted his ankle a couple weeks ago. He's been out for at least the last three games. Uh, Sylvester Vandervater, he broke his ankle in the end of the Charlotte FC game. Uh, they're hopeful he can come back sometime towards the end of the season, but I don't know if they're ever going to risk that right. because it's, it's, it's a bone. It's also muscular damage on top of that. So he's probably not going to be a factor. So realistically right now, in terms of their winger depth, it's, it's Facundo Torres and other. They've basically been playing Junior Urso, who is a, normally an eight, a box-to-box -box midfielder. They've been playing him as the right winger. Uh, that just kind of shows you where, where they're at depth-wise. They're struggling, huh? Because I, I like Junior Urso. I like Junior Urso as a player, but obviously he's more of a, like you said, more of an in-the-middle type of player, central player. Mm -hmm. uh, I, he's got a lot of a lot of tenacity to him, can break things up. If they're playing him on the wing and he's not the most talented or crafty guy on the ball, then, yeah, they must be they must be hurting a little bit, a little bit there. I'm going to ask you flat out for your opinion on this. Mm. Do they miss... Luis Nani, because Inter Miami had a lot of Nani nightmares when they played Orlando City over the last <laughs> couple of years. Even in games where maybe he wasn't at his best over the course of the 90 minutes from the run of play, he would pop in and either make the difference with an assist, a goal. He just found ways to make an impact. Obviously, salary, age, long-term picture, that all goes into the thinking and the planning for an MLS side. But even last year, 22 starts in 28 games, 10 goals, 8 assists. He's off to Venezia now in, in, in Italy. Hasn't had the maybe the best season there. But, you know, just what, what do you think that the Lions miss that nanny factor, that the player that could make that type of difference, this group of players? I would say absolutely. Uh, I yeah. think that because it's more first half of season nanny than anything, because second half of season nanny was when he basically disappeared and had. I think probably like two total goal contributions in the mm -hmm. last like 12, 13 games of the season. And first half of the season, Nani was dominant, you know, uh, not 2019 because he came in kind of uh, tired from the, the European season before, but like 2020, 2021, absolutely. He was, he was dominating and uh, proved a lot of doubters wrong for Orlando, at least for, for giving him a, a three-year contract. And, you know, at the end of the three-year contract, they said, right, we're good now. Thank you. And they've brought in uh, Facundo Torres, who's, who's 22 years old, as a designated player from Peñarol. And while he hasn't been the same player as Nani, you can see the the talent, the, the, the raw talent kind of 
being cultivated right. in that position in Facundo. Um, Nani is a different beast because he played at Manchester United. He's played at the biggest stages. He just couldn't keep it up throughout the entirety of the season. Um, and for the salary that he was asking for, it wouldn't have made sense to have him basically as a, a first man off the bench. So I think that, yes, you miss him in certain aspects, but for the long-term goals of this team, I think Facundo Torres is growing into his own and can be a, a dangerous player in his own right. I like some of your Spanish pronunciations there, and that should come in handy for you a little <laughs> bit later on here on this podcast. Now, Austin, very quickly, mm. we've talked about the team in terms of their inconsistencies. We've talked about some of their danger men. What kind of game, and obviously it's early in the week, so I'm sure there's still obviously some assessing to do in terms of who will play and how exactly they'll play, but by and large, there's probably an overall idea of what we'll see from Orlando City on Wednesday night. So what can Inter-Miami fans expect from this Orlando City team at home? Will they look to dictate the tempo? Are they a team that likes to possess with combinations and try to break you down in that way? Obviously, you've touched on the fact that they're they're reeling a bit in terms of personnel, but from the outside, as of today, what do you think we will expect from Orlando City in terms of their game plan and what will be the key to the game for them on Wednesday night? Now, normally I would say that they are the protagonists. Oscar Pereja has used that word many times since he joined Orlando City right. in 2019. Protagonistas, protagonistas, yes. Exactly. Protagonists. However, over the last uh, probably year total, like second half of last year, first half of this year, they haven't really been protagonists. They've been more reactionists. And by that I mean they are usually reacting to what other teams throw at them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for example, with, with Austin, they kind of took what Austin was, was doing uh, on Sunday night and used it against them. Right. Reactive, uh, not proactive. Exactly. So, you know, Austin was pressing numbers forward. They didn't have their fullbacks back to defend. So as soon as Orlando was getting the ball, they'd send four guys forward to try and basically just lop it over top and, and get behind the defense. Whereas, you know, teams that are high pressing, they're going to try and move the ball around and try and uh, force players to, to run at the ball and then move the ball fairly quickly around the midfield, then try and make a line breaking pass to open up the defense that way. So it really generally depends on how other teams will play against them. And, you know, d depending, I think, Against high-pressing teams, they've had a lot of issues. I mean, Red Bulls is is the main kind of game you look at because they do high-pressing so well, and they're very uh, dedicated in their craft. So if a team plays like that, Orlando's going to have some problems because they like to play it out of the back. They like to they don't like to play it long, necessarily. Uh, they'll start the, uh, the, the play with Pedro Galese in, in goal and then kind of move it around the defense, try and break into the midfield, and then get it out wide. Uh, and then, you know, they, they usually have in the attacking third clump up on, at the top of the 18 uh, with a number of different players. But it also depends on the personnel. So I can tell you right now that Mason Stadahar is probably going to be starting goal. He's been their cup goalkeeper throughout this U.S. Open Cup run. Um, they've also been utilizing a lot of their younger players like Thomas Williams, who is a 17 year old center back. Um, he's six foot four last i checked and he's still growing so he Not, is no short guy there huh no no he's he's i mean i'm six two and he towers over me so it's definitely humble weird brag to see. humble brag from us yeah. by the way i didn't know you were that tall i didn't know you were that tall because normally we just sit in the press box so yeah, yeah, yeah i don't think i've ever seen you stand up but i didn't realize you were that tall yeah in my heyday i used to be able to dunk nice but... nice another humble brag yeah <laughs> just, just had to throw that out there but hey, um uh Outside of, of Thomas Williams, you might see a Mikey Holiday, a 19-year-old product as well from the Academy. Uh, those two have been playing in the U.S. Open Cup games to this point. Uh, Thomas was two games ago, and uh, Mikey played in their last game against Philly. Uh, they're definitely raw. You definitely see the potential, but you can also see that they, are, uh, they still need more game time to be uh, consistent enough. And but at home... Orlando City will probably be more protagonist than Inter Miami, I imagine. You know, you say that, but it's been weird with their home uh, opponents because in, in, against different teams, 
they have tried to be protagonists and they've gotten burned because of it. Interesting. And again, I think the emotions will be running high for this team based on what happened on Sunday. Uh, they'll probably want to kind of uh, come back from that performance. I know with Rodrigo Schlegel and Cesar Araujo, they're probably going to start because they're suspended for the next game against right. uh, FC Dallas on the weekend. So you might as well use those guys while you can. Um, but they, they've also been using a lot of their, their younger players. Um, Jake Mulraney is another player that they've been using in league play, but he's not able to compete for Orlando because he played for Atlanta United in the U S open cup before he was traded to Orlando. So that's another uh-huh. winger that they don't have as far as depth. Good, good tidbit. Good tidbit. And another name into Miami players. I mean, excuse me, another name into Miami fans will like to keep an eye on is Alexandre Pato, who obviously is not the player he used to be, but obviously he's a, he's a player with some recognizable name power. And mm-hmm. he could feature in this game at some point, whether it's starting or, or off the bench. Honestly, I well, before you move on, I want to say Pato did not play in the Austin game, making me think he'll probably start for the Miami game. Former Brazilian international. It'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see if he does start, how he does against the Inter Miami backline, see if he can use that experience and savviness. Austin, before we let you go, we have one thing that we ask all our guests to do. And this is why I said those Spanish pronunciations might come in handy. <laughs> this podcast is called Miami Total Football Radio. But when I came up with the name moving back to South Florida, I said it has to also be something that can be said in Spanish. So it is also known as Miami Total Football Radio. And we roll the R's in everything. I'm going to ask you to... Try to say it in Spanish with the R's rolled and everything. We've had every guest do it. We have a depth chart or we have a pecking order. There's no way you will be last. It's impossible. <laughs> impossible that you will be last. But give it your give it your shot. I think you're gonna do surprisingly well. Dark Force, Austin David. Alright, let's let's give this a try then. <clears throat> Miami Total Football Radio. Hey! I told you, Dark Horse David in the house, man. That was good. That was good. That was impressive. Very well done from Austin. David, Austin, where can people find your work if they're not already tuning in already? Uh, over at the Orlando Sentinel. Uh, I've been covering Orlando City and Orlando Pride this season. And uh, you can also follow any of my uh, podcast stuff over at the Orlando Soccer Show, where we do weekly stuff. Uh, We've got an interview coming out next week with a former Orlando City player who was either the first or second ever homegrown player that was signed back in the USL days. So that was a a very fun interview. He played under Jesse Marsh at New York Red Bulls, Tommy Redding. uh, Talked a little bit about him and Leeds and how... That's a throwback, man. uh, throwback Yeah. Wow. Very, very much. Um, but, yeah, he, he was a very insightful and uh, very good interview. So looking forward to, to everyone hearing that. That is Austin David. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us again, Austin. We're going to take a quick break. We'll come back and we'll do the Q&A session. We'll do that after this. Okay, it's Q&A time, ladies and gentlemen. And I said in the first segment that we had something to talk about with Bryce Duke, so let's do that here. Can't see me gets the first question of the week. He says, Duke's ability and willingness to turn and carry the ball and break lines has been extremely impressive. With this team looking more cohesive, how much of that has to do with him and what do you think his ceiling could be? So I'll I raved about Bryce Duke and his introduction into the midfield because it gives the team more football, more soccer. I did that in one of the most recent pods. They've all kind of blended together a little bit because of how rapid they've been coming. But I think in this game, he was a bit too selfish at times. Not making the right pass, not making the right decision. In one moment in the second half, he committed a turnover by not passing the ball. And then he didn't get back defensively. And I believe... From what I saw up in the press box, maybe my my reading of the game was wrong in this moment. 
but I believe DeAndre Yedlin gave him a, an earful and was yelling at his in his direction to get back and help defend because he didn't on that play. He was pulled later on in the second half. I think Phil Neville probably saw some of the similar things that it wasn't Bryce Duke's brightest day or sharpest day, but overall, very, very much like what Bryce Duke has brought in. What's his ceiling? That's a good question I'd have to think a lot more on, so I will leave that for a later time. Jose, anything you want to add there? Did you get the same impression that, that Bryce Duke didn't have his best game in this one, although he's been a net positive by being introduced as a starting midfielder for Inter Miami? Yeah, I would agree with that. But, you know, you, you, you kind of have to expect the situation in which, you know, he's he's having a, a couple of good games and then maybe, you know, uh, and the up and down situation for him right now is only normal. Let me put it that way. Because he's still very young. He is young. He's 21. So um, I think, you know, this is the year for him to, that, that you know, he can get away with an on and off situation. And even even with me saying that, I don't want to, I don't want people to think that he played, uh, you know, he didn't play well. I mean, he was okay. But, you know, he has shown better. So the standard for him is not the same for somebody else in the, on the team or some other players on the team. We see that he's good. You know, we see the development. We see that, you know, he can actually provide something to the team that was missing before he um, he was inserted in the starting lineup. And so that's what, what we come to expect from him. So uh, just to be clear, he didn't have a great game, but he wasn't bad at all. He wasn't he wasn't terrible. So it wasn't I, his I sharpest you know, game. It wasn't his sharpest outing. Yeah, but you're expecting a lot from him, right? You're expecting you're expecting a good performance. I'm not him. expecting a lot. I just don't think it was his sharpest game. And I think when it's not your sharpest game, then the effort has to be there and the willingness to defend has to be there. And I think that's where, you know, maybe Bryce Dukes has tired legs because he's been playing quite a bit as of late. He's been a starter, so maybe he's had tired legs. But Again, I think, you know, Bryce Duke's a young player. Maybe he's learning, he's still learning that, that if it's not your day with the ball, you're not your sharpest, you're not at your sharpest, excuse me, then you have to at least put in the work defensively and, and, and help out in that way. And he may be tired on late, but he it looked like DeAndre Yedlin was was giving him an earful. He was yelling at him because he didn't get back on a play on a play where in which he lost the ball. And I think that's why Phil Neville pulls him out. I think that's why he pulls him out. Let me define young player. 21 years old, just to be clear. He's 21 years old. His birthday was February 28th this year. So he's 21. He will be 22 next year. Just to be clear, because, you know, 21, it's borderline. We can call him young, up and coming. We, we see the example with Noah Allen situation where he's really, really young. And then we see the scenario with Robert Robinson, who gets called young player several Every every other day in South Florida, <laughs> and he's not, and he's not. So just to be clear, to define young player, what exactly that means? Well, we talked about this last podcast as well. There's there's different terminology for young. Young as a, as a person, yes, he's young as a person. Young as a soccer player, getting on the older side of a of a young soccer player in the general sense, but still young. In the American landscape because there's college and, and all that even though he he was he's been a pro for several years now he'd probably still be considered young. yes but you know he he played for lafc right he played for las vegas light right. he's not he's not a he's not a newbie to I, yeah the professional i think league. this is the last year where we can call him a oh, young guy give him a break yeah i think this is it i think this is it after this year then you know it gets real for him no island a little bit more breathing room he's only what 18 17 17 okay all right i think his birthday was a few days ago wasn't it maybe no, I... I don't i don't i don't have the inter miami birthday calendars in front of me so okay so, yeah. <laughs> shame on you shame on you jose i mean was it his birthday i don't know you you tell me it was his birthday just a few. Oh, weeks. he did turn eighteen on April twenty eighth, so uh, a month ago, a month ago, a month you ago. You missed that celebration. I was I wasn't invited to the party apparently. So, Jose is the the ringleader when it comes to the fiestas for Inter Miami. But okay, let's continue on. Next one comes from Phil. It's not Phil Neville. It's just Phil. 
He says, oh, you got next. <laughs> he says, I have two questions. In your eyes, how vital is the match on Wednesday versus Orlando? Two, with Higuain getting fit again and obviously contributing positively as he did last night, do you see a change in system to accommodate him more, or will he remain an impact player? Jose. It's huge. It's huge. It's the, the most important game in Inter Miami's history. I'll put it that way. There's no bigger game than the game against Orlando on Wednesday. There's no bigger game. There's no bigger game. And I'm dead serious about this. I am serious about this. There's no bigger game than the Open Cup for Inter Miami because it is the only shot for this team to win something this year. Other than the than the Challenge Cup, was it the Challenge Cup? The yeah, the Carolina Challenge Cup. The Carolina Challenge Cup. Okay. After the Carolina Challenge Cup, the only shot at Inter Miami winning a championship this year is the U.S. Open Cup, and there's no bigger trophy than the um, U.S. Open Cup in the United States of America. And of course, as you all know, that gives winning the Open Cup gives you an opportunity to play in the Champions League. Diego Alonso's dream will, well, will become a reality if Inter Miami ends up winning. But unfortunately, he will not be coaching that team. It'll become a reality for Phil now, not, not for day? not for Diego Alonso. Do you remember that day? Do you remember that day? Which day? When Diego Alonso was introduced and they started talking about Champions League and winning the I Champions. Hadn't, I hadn't moved back yet. I, I watched it uh, from from New York City. I was still in the process of moving back and packing my boxes. But yeah. I remember. That memorable, memorable, memorable moment for me. That was that was crazy. But yeah, I mean, there's there's no bigger there's no bigger game right now. There's no bigger game. I would sacrifice two three games. I wouldn't care about Portland. I wouldn't care about the next three weeks of MLS play as long as you move on from Orlando. Well, after Portland, after Portland, they have a break. They've got a break of, of a couple of weeks. So, well, you got to push. Yeah, I think you have to push. It's an important game. It's a shame it's on a Wednesday. It's a shame it's on a Wednesday because that's going to limit the people that attend from Orlando. It's going to limit the number of people that make the drive from Miami and Fort Lauderdale. So it will take away from some of the environment and the atmosphere that could be had at Exploria Stadium in Central Florida. But it's a very important game. And I'm expecting a good one. I'm expecting a good one. And, and good news for Inter Miami is that Nani is no longer on the team as we talked about in the last segment with Austin David. Because Nani had been an Inter Miami nightmare. He he just found ways to make an impact, whether it's a goal or an assist, whether it's popping up at the very end. He just found ways to to wreak havoc. So yes, very important game, big game for Inter Miami. I'd have to give it some more thought if I would like to label it like Jose did as the most important game in the franchise's history. Okay, we have but time. It, no, no, no. I'd have to think about it a lot more. And we have other questions. We have other questions to get to, including. How is that even possible? What else? What else? What other game? What has Inter Miami played for before? I mean, they played in a playoff game. That was pretty important. They got crushed, but that was pretty important. That was a plane. Is it, that is that legally a playoff game? It's, that was it's playing. called it's called in MLS. Yes, it's playoff game because you, it counts as making the playoffs. So it's a playing <laughs> game, and we can argue the semantics of it. And I might agree with you. I probably would give you the benefit of the doubt. I'd give you that razón. But it does count as a playoff game by MLS standards, whatever. So we have other questions to get to, Jose. And we didn't even touch on Iguain. the question about Iguain from Phil here. Do you see a change in the system to accommodate him more, or will he remain an impact player? I've already said my answer. He's going to be a super sub for much of the rest of the way, unless something happens to Leonardo Campana that is unforeseen. Jose? I think it's possible. Yes, I think it's possible that, you know, we see a tweak in the lineup. You know, depending, obviously, on this, what the situation is with the wingers. Um, uh, we'll see what happens over the summer as well. Maybe a change of personnel could, you know, uh, maybe open up, open things up for Iwain. Maybe that's the case. You know, I think if, if he's able to 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 get back into into the level maybe that we saw last year, um, I think he he will be deserving of a starting spot, so I, I wouldn't rule it out. I think I think it's a possibility. I would rule it out. I don't see them changing the lineup to make way so for it's for gonna happen, buddy. It's going to happen. No chance. No chance. Happen. No Listen chance. To me, I told you all about Ari Lassiter months ago. I told you all, and Franco was trying to lead a you. Bl- to- hey, a blind knight finds a squirrel every now and then too. Okay, Jose. And in, <laughs> and in your kingdom, it's very possible since you're the only one out there. But. <laughs> 
Talk Inter Miami CF has the next question very quickly, Jose, because we've already discussed this. Do you guys think Drake Calendar secured the starting spot? And also, do you think that these group of guys work harder and more of a team compared to last season's squad? I say yes to Drake Calendar. I say yes that this is more of a team than what we saw over the last 12 months in Phil Neville's first year. This team maybe doesn't play the best soccer, maybe has quite a few holes by and large. But there's effort, there's cohesiveness. It looks like a team. It doesn't look like the disconnected, disjointed group that we saw for much of the 2021 campaign. Yeah, I would agree with you on both. Oh, no, on just the second. <laughs> oh, we almost had him. We almost had him. Not the first one. Not the first one. But I, I do. I, do I, was like, about to, I was about to get my agent fees to go up, man. Come on. No, nah, yeah, almost. But no, not, <laughs> not that fast. Uh, yeah, I, w- I would say I would say on, on the second part on, on on I would give credit to you know coaching staff. I think you know they're a lot more in control than last year when it comes to the roster, and I think that helps a lot. And uh, of course, you know, winning will will help a lot if if they're able to accomplish a lot more than what they did last year. I think I think that that this will be a step forward. But yeah, I think it it looks a lot better. It looks a lot better. Next one comes from Luis Mega very quickly, Jose, because he all he puts is, can we talk about the bet? And he sends me a screenshot of the of the game played from the players on Inter Miami's roster. Ariel Lasseter is second on the screenshot or the picture that he took, and he has a little circle around games played and an arrow drawn to the 13 in Ariel Lasseter's line there. So... We've Before talked about it. it. It's looking good for Jose on our non-bet yes. bet. I have to correct you, Luis, because we uh, didn't make the bet. It's a non-bet bet, and it's looking good for Jose. It's looking good for Jose. Say, I will. I will name Leo of Jose Jose's island uh, island Jose's kingdom. He's a top resident now that you are now. <laughs> our, he has been invited. Top priority gets in, gets out anytime he wants. So. Leo, welcome. Welcome home, my friend. Yes, I'm winning that bet. I'm winning that bet. And I said Did it. Did you say first. Leo? Wasn't it Airy? Are you jumping ship here? I'm saying that I'm saying that the first day I said that the first day of preseason, everybody. First day. Yeah, but first you just said Leo. You said Leo. You didn't say Adi. You said Leo. Leo asked the question. Oh. No, it was Luis that asked the question. Oh, I'm sorry, Luis. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're Leo Luis. So you, you've, lo- you've lost Luis now. Luis. By the way, Luis also put a, a circle and an arrow to the 13 in terms of the games played. The bet, or the non-bet bet, excuse me, was on starts. And right now, Lasseter has, which is included in, this, in the screenshot, though not circled by Luis, Ariel Lasseter has eight starts. And we the, the, the number was 25, which he's well on his way to getting. Well on his way to getting. So, let's continue. And it's not eight, but let's not get into that. It's not eight. It's more than that, but... No, no, right. Uh, there's there's open cup one, so it's ten. It's ten right now. It's ten. We have it. No, it's more than that as well. No, but okay. Preseason Mo- let's, count. Let's move on. Last last question, Don Cafecito, and he's touching on a topic that I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, because I don't think we've ever really spoken about this. Don Cafecito says, I propose we Inter Miami fans officially name future matches as the Derby del Sol because many successful years between teams and animosity with players and fans is needed before anyone can appropriately call it a clásico. So I call this der- this derby, this rivalry, El Clásico del Sol, aka in English, the Sunshine Clásico. I think it's a an appropriate name. I think it's it's something that's not super generic. I like the nickname, so I've been calling it that since the first year, since twenty twenty. I think it works. It's not, and there's other you know because there's other iterations like El Sunshine Derby or El Derby del Sol, which there's already one called that in Italy. So I think Sunshine Classical works. Classico del Sol. I don't think you need to have years of animosity to call it a Classico because a Classico just means essentially rivalry. So it's the word used for derby in Spanish in football terms. So Right. I don't like the Sunshine Classico a lot. Let me be honest with it. I think um, I've heard before... Uh, let me see if I can. Re- oh yeah, um, the I ninety five classic, El Clásico de la noventa y cinco. I like something like that a lot better. The Sunshine Clásico, I don't know, but you know, I think that that requires. I don't like the Sunshine Clásico, but I like the I ninety five Clásico. What? That's like the almost the same thing. You're just taking the Sunshine, which is what 
Florida is known for and putting in I-95, which is something a little bit more. So you want me to take the word classico out of it? No, that... I'm just saying your argument doesn't make sense to me. You're like, oh, I don't like something classical, but I like I-95 classical, which, by the way, I-95 goes beyond Florida. So, no, I don't know. And that nickname, no bueno, no bueno. Yeah, but that's the road we all take to Magic Kingdom. So No, that's, that's not true. I take Turnpike, my friend. So there you go. You gotta pay those. Well, tw- you gotta pay those twenty dollars each way, but you get there a little bit faster. Well, because you're rich, so. <laughs> or, or, I'm, I'm rich. Oh my yeah. goodness, that's rich. Your comment is rich because there's no way that I'm rich, brother. I'm a soccer <laughs> football reporter. Trust me, I in the United States. Trust me, I am not. I am not rich. I am not rolling in the dough. I don't live in Parkland, <coughs> Primo. <laughs> so move, you know. move out of the turnpike, then you're gonna get in trouble. <laughs> All right. So that does it for the Q and A session, Jose. There's one thing I wanted to touch on very quickly before we get to our final thoughts, and that's the MLS Players Association releasing the salaries last week. Something I briefly mentioned when, it, when the news first came out, but not something we really dissected and dived into. I'm sure you had a chance to look at them. Leonardo Campanas is still, though he's on loan. Anything in there surprise you? Any any bargains or anything that you were like, I like what I saw there. That's a pretty good deal for Inter Miami, or mm, I don't really like that for Inter Miami. What you know, just your overall your biggest takeaways from Inter Miami in the MLS Players Association salary list. Uh, well, this is. Uh... By the way, by the way, why why you think about how to get that sentence out? I had an Inter Miami player that reached out to me that said, "That's not accurate. Those numbers are not accurate." Which I've heard before; those numbers are not one hundred percent right what the players earn, but it gives you a ballpark figure, an overall idea of the numbers that they're on. So, based off yeah. that, Jose, what did you think? Give me your biggest takeaway. Looking at those numbers, you know, I I think I think Campan is probably the the player that you look for and. And, and but you, you kind of understand the situation, right? Because he's on loan. If if they buy so him, if they, he'll he'll be that that number will skyrocket. Right, right, yeah. So he could, um, he could but, probably command a DP salary, probably. Come on, here we go, Jose. Yeah, he's he, Jose. Hold on, Jose. Hold on. You know, there's no, no. a train that goes oh near. Goodness. I'm gonna make a song someday about this saying. There's a train that goes nearby Drive Pink Stadium, and that train. It's a huge train, but at the top, or in front, I should say, there's only one man, and that man is Franco Panizzo. The overreaction <laughs> train has arrived at Drive Pink Stadium. Oh, I thought it was Brightline. No, it's the, okay, I got you. No, I got you. They, they have to pay for me to say that name. <laughs> listen, listen. If he gets bought out, that, in, that includes or that requires a transfer fee in addition to his full salary. And those numbers will probably easily, for a striker that's young and coming from a European club, will probably put him at a DP threshold, making him a designated player. But quickly, I will say this. Look, there's some interesting numbers there to look at. Drake Calendar, for example, is on $130,000 based on, on what the MLSPA has put out. Nick Marsman, in contrast, makes $587,000. Gonzalo Higuain, of course, we have to talk about Gonzalo Higuain. He's on $5.8 million. Leandro Gonzalo Pires is also listed there, so interesting. Gregory makes $801,000. So some interesting Penny. numbers. I, I I encourage Inter-Miami fans to, to just take a look at them. Kieran Gibbs, $378,000. But just take a look at them, take a gander, see what some of these players are making. Jovan Jones, $458,000. That's a pretty, pretty penny for him. But that does it for our Q&A session and that part of it. Let's give our final thoughts. Jose, you can start, and then I'll give mine, and we'll wrap up the show after that. Uh, my final thought is on Nations League. Um, Inter-Miami got some call-ups already. I think Damian Lowe. Edison Ascona, DeAndre Jetlin. So, you know, obviously, you know, with Nations League starting, that's an official tournament. So, thankfully, this time around, Inter Miami will have a break at some point. But, you know, it's it's going to be an interesting topic because, you know, players not only will be traveling, but they will be playing several games within a short amount of time. And so, uh, best of luck to the guys. 
going on to Nations League, except if anybody plays against Honduras. Sorry about you, Mark. My final thought is on something we did not touch on on this pod, which was Chris Henderson, the Inter-Miami Sporting Director, is in Spain right now. He posted a picture on Monday on his Instagram, walking around the streets of Madrid, Real Zaragoza, the team that Jorge Mas and Jose Mas recently acquired the majority majority portion of. They, you know, he was he was in the stands watching one of their games on Sunday or over the weekend. See what happens or what comes from this. I imagine he's definitely doing some scouting. He's not just going over there just to shake hands. I imagine there's some scouting going on there. Let's not start with the rumors for Luis Suarez, Antoine Griezmann, Marcelo, or Gareth Bale just yet, but it is a fact, es un hecho, that Chris Henderson is in Spain right now. But that does it for this first show of the week. We will be back in a few days to recap and analyze the Sunshine Clásico, El Clásico del Sol, sorry Jose, against Orlando City, as well as preview the weekend game against the Portland Timbers. So, for Jose Armando, a.k.a. Island Jose, I am Franco Penizo. You have been listening to Miami Total Football.